Listen to this in Ephesians. If you have a Bible with you today, turn it to Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 18. It says, in underline, highlight it, cut it out, or make a photocopy and cut it out, paste it on the wall, whatever. Don't cut it out of Bible. That's something like Thomas Jefferson. Did. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. We should expect, we should want God's Spirit to just overflow in our lives. Be filled with the Spirit. And then look at this, if you're looking with me. And he goes on to say, be filled with the Spirit. Listen to this now, it's key. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks to the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord. What does that sound like to you all? What's that sound like as a description of it? Superman and Chief, because you heard the sermon earlier earlier today, but I think you guessed right though. What does that sound like? What does that sound like as a description of it? The songs and the hymns and the spiritual songs. Terry would not. Coming together, praising God, giving thanks. What does that sound like a description of? The fire should know. The fire knows everything. What is it? What does it sound like? Church! Worship! Amen! Be filled. Be filled with the Spirit. See, we don't realize how important this is right here. We don't, don't get it, I don't think. We don't realize how important this hour is. This time together. It's finally important. And if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we can't go without it. We need it. We need to crave it. As you're singing. We'll be filled as we come together. And we've got to get it straight what worship really is. Worship is not about me being entertained. It's not about me... <coughs> having my ears tickled. That's not worship. That's something else too. And there's a lot of that going around. Worship, first and foremost, is not so much about, first about, not so much about what I'm going to get out of. It's first about what's God going to get out of my worship today? How am I going to bless God with my worship today? You heard the old saying, I used to hear it all the time from coaches and school teachers. You get out of something what you do what? You get out of something what you put into it. Look at your hymn. Turn to Roman numeral 7. One of the first pages right after the, the first page. You got the prevalence, Roman numeral number 5. Look at Roman numeral number 7. These are directions for singing. Directions for singing. They come from John Wesley himself. Straight from John Wesley. And I, I just want to, to, to take your attention to the Roman numeral number four, the fourth final day. He says, sing lustily. Sing lustily, passionately. Passionately. And with good courage. Boldness. Beware of singing as if you were half dead. <coughs> or half asleep. But lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now. No more ashamed of its being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Now I know some of you, if you were like me, could be caught somewhere riding down the road in a car. If somebody was eavesdropping on you and had a little bug in your car, they could catch you singing. 
Sing out to the top of your lungs. Deaf leopard. <laughs> Pour some sugar on me, dude. Garth Brooks. I got friends in little places. ACDC. I'm on the highway. Oh, it's bad, eh? Not highway to heaven. He had Led Zeppelin. He had Stairway to Heaven. He had Stairway to Heaven, right? But if somebody told me if you play that backwards, it's uh, something about some boy saying, I'm going to drag you to hell. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Stairway to Heaven. Uh, somebody played it backwards for me at the ball field the other day. When we came, we, we get so passionate about these worldly things when we come in here with, uh, you know, she just can't wait to get out of here. Which that guy would shut up. <laughs> I am so ready to go home. I'm so hungry. I want to go over to the Grandma Alex right now. And he's going, I'm not going to be able to beat the Baptist to the buffet. <laughs> We've got to put our heart into it. If we're going to be filled with the Spirit, this is vital. This moment, this time, this hour is vital. So we've got to come together and pour our heart out and empty ourselves in worship of God. And part of what we're doing when we come together is we're emptying ourselves of those things that we need to empty ourselves of. We're renouncing our sins when we're convicted of sin. We're renouncing the ways that we have walked contrary to the will of God. We're confessing our sin, pouring our heart out to God. And in that process, God will refill us with His Spirit. And we need to be, expect to be filled. We need to expect to be filled with the Spirit of God to overflowing. And we need to expect these gifts of the Spirit to be in operation in our lives. We need to, to know that God wants to use us, to work through us, to bless us, to be a blessing to other people. To witness to His goodness. To witness to His love. To witness to His grace and His mercy. To attract others. God wants to work in us that way. In young and old, Joel, the prophecy that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Joel, he said, My Spirit in the last days will be poured out on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters, your old and your young, all male, female, young, all, all of us will be filled with the Spirit of God and the gifts of the Spirit of God. Paul lists here nine different gifts. There are others. He lists nine here. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, these, these gifts of revelation. Now these are not things, we've got to keep in mind the word gift. It's a gift because it's something God gives us and we can't make Him give it to us. It's not something we earn. See, I can't come together here. If i got a big rock band type service here going, you know, a big rock band, and uh, had about a you know, stadium. And, and we did, had all these lights and lasers and all of this stuff. None of that could conjure God the Spirit up. Now we think, we get confused and we think that that's how you do it. Is that's how you get the Spirit. Is you, build, you have a, just a big rock concert almost. But you might get a Spirit, all right. I don't know if it's going to be the Spirit of God, though, but you can't make God show up. God comes where He wants to. And He gives these gifts just as He, the Spirit, chooses. Right? I said, yeah. We can pray for it. We can ask for it. But we can't absolutely demand it and, and certainly not covet it for our own use and our own benefit. That's part of what the, the mix-up was in Corinth. And then they started glorifying themselves because of these great powers that they had. I could tell y'all a long story about a snake handling group that I'll tell you some other time, but it was just fascinating. But this the snake handling group, it became obvious as I read this, this story about them, that their ability, and we're, this is not a gift of the Spirit, by the way, so don't get nervous, I'm not pro, promote snake handling. But it was obvious that these, these preachers who would handle these snakes and their ability to, to preach with these snakes crawling all over them. And they would even, you know, like this one guy, his name was Pumpkin Brown. He up here in the mountains somewhere. He would, he would 
had one of those big long timber rattlesnakes about that long, about that big around, and he would just wipe the sweat off, the, off of his brow of that snake while he was preaching. But then he would use that gift that he had that they claimed that anybody could do to say, well, look, I must really be the one who has the Spirit because I can do this. And you need to listen to what I'm telling you. You see what I'm saying there? He was using the gift to manipulate. And it wasn't a gift of God. I have no qualms about saying that. No, you know, you were so worried about offending people today. I'm more worried about offending God than I am about offending other people. They want to be loving and kind, but we need to be concerned about whether we're offending God or not. But the bottom line is these gifts, the gifts of God that He gives us, and He wants us to use these gifts as He gives them to us to bless others. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, these gifts of being able to know something that you could not possibly know any other way. It can happen. It does happen. Sometimes we even miss it because we're not paying attention. The gift of discernment, being able to discern when evil is a leaf, when there's false doctrine and false teaching, where we can cut through the lies, the cacophony of lies that are out there in the world and cut straight to the truth and pull through all of that stuff. And we can get to the heart of the matter of what's really, really important. The kingdom of this world runs on lies and deceit. And it leads to destruction. That's the enemy's game. He's the father. He's the father too. And he's the father of lies and deceit. And the spirit of discernment in the church can help us to see through those things. The spirit of prophecy. Be able to speak the word of God boldly in the situations. These, these gifts all work together. You, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, promises that all of us together can do the works that he did in greater. And I promise you, you have gifts. You have abilities. And you should expect God to work in you and through you and use those gifts and abilities. There was a young man in my community when I was growing up. He was a little bit older than me. He was a baseball pitcher. Left-handed pitcher. Had a mean curveball and a good fastball. And he got drafted by the Los Angeles Dodgers. And after about half of the season in the minor leagues, he got kicked off the team, had to come home because of drugs. And you know, that community was just devastating and disappointed. They were so excited when he got drafted. And it wasn't long before they were just left absolutely heartbroken and disappointed. Wow. Why did they feel that way? He, he squandered he squandered the gifts and the talents that he could give. And they were disappointed. Jesus told a parable about some talents. One was given five, another was given two, and one was given one. And two of the three received a message that said when they used their talents and they multiplied and doubled them, the message was, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will make you responsible for very, very, very much. Expect God to work in you. Expect God to fill you with His Spirit, to overflow, and to equip you and empower you. I could get, I could go on and on, and you know I would if uh, I could. But the time is getting late. Don't underestimate. What God wants to do in your life. Don't say, Who am I? I'm a nobody. God's got a way of making nobodies into great somebodies and doing through us more than we could ever even ask, think, or imagine. 